Dean has a background in wildlife biology and zoology and received his PhD in organismal biology and ecology. All of his training was from the University of Montana. Since 2005, he's been at the U.S. Department of Agriculture Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. He's part of the Wildlife and Terrestrial Ecosystems Program. He's also an adjunct faculty with the Ecology and Evolution faculty at the University of Montana. He leads a community ecology and invasive species research team that's addressing fundamental questions in community ecology and exploring the causes and consequences of biological invasions and the efficacy of invasive species management strategies. It was a recent paper from Dean's group concerning an analysis of unintended consequences associated with past management actions that my co-host Hector Kamada and I found informative and that speaks to those thinking about field trials of gene drive technologies under the ever-present threat of unintended consequences. You'll hear a bit about that today and more. So Dean, thanks again for being here and welcome. And at this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Yeah, thanks for having me and uh, welcome to everyone who's on board here. So I will just jump right in. Uh, what I want to do today is I'm going to talk about the challenges we face in doing conservation in the Anthropocene. Uh, as human populations continue to rise around the globe, we're seeing ever increasing pressures on biological diversity, ecosystem services, our ecosystem functions and the services that systems provide to humans. And in response to this, conservation managers are using increasingly powerful tools to try and combat these threats and balance this equation. Uh, and in, often these, are, uh, these tools are resulting in very good outcomes, but sometimes they can result in unintended outcomes that uh, sometimes have pretty deleterious consequences. And so what I wanna do today is I wanna talk about how we can potentially use community ecology to uh, help us better both achieve our intended objectives and also help uh, avoid some of these unintended outcomes. And this is based on some work that myself and my colleagues, TJ Clark and Phil Hahn have been conducting. And most of what I'm gonna talk about today can be found in this paper that is uh, available in conservation biology online. It's not out in hard copy yet, but uh, it's been available for a while. And the last part of what I'm gonna talk about today, which is focused on qualitative modeling, um, is some work that we're just wrapping up now and hope to get in the next month or so, so that we'll go through the vetting process and hopefully be available to folks uh, soon as well. All right, so a sage prophet uh, once said, um, times they are a changing. That was of course, Bob Dylan. Uh, and times uh, indeed are a change. And in fact, today we live in an age that is now entitled the Anthropocene in recognition of the fact that one species, humans, us, now dominates the planet in such a way that we affect the livelihood and potential survival of every other organism on the planet. And there's five main ways in which we do, these, uh, do this. And so I just, just wanna highlight these briefly. So habitat destruction is a major obvious one, land transformation, uh, agriculture, this sort of thing. Uh, exploitation, this includes hunting, trapping, fishing, uh, timber harvest, mining, this sort of thing. Uh, pollution, and here we're including not just nasty chemicals that are going into the system, but also good things like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, which in high doses can be problematic as well. And of course, uh, with the advent of trains, planes, and automobiles, we are introducing organisms from one continent to another with sometimes fairly um, deleterious effects. And then finally, uh, last but not least, and overarching all of this is climate change. And so each one of these is a major driver of impacts uh, on the globe. And of course they interact um, to cause all kinds of um, chaos that's happening on the planet. And in response to these challenges, conservation managers are um, applying in increasingly powerful tools. Um, and the ones that I really want to focus on today are tools related to the wholesale introduction or extirpation of species. Um, so these are intentional uh, introductions and extir extirpations of species. And again, there's five main categories here, and they tend to respond to um, each of the categories that I just mentioned, each of the threats uh, in kind. Um, so one of these, assisted migration, is a direct response to climate change. Here, we're, we're concerned about species that are 
sensitive to and directly threatened by climatic change. And so we're moving them to new environments where we think that they will be safe from this challenge. So this is um, introduction of species. Biological control, of course, classical biological control is the uh, introduction of exotic organisms for the control of exotic pest species. And so here again, we're introducing um, species. Rewilding, so rewilding in its classic sense, uh, in its, its more restricted definition, which is how I'm focusing on it here, uh, is generally the introduction of an organism that's novel to a system to replace uh, an ecosystem function linked to an organism that is no longer extant. So one example of this might be, uh, you have an island where there was a desert tortoise in the system, that desert tortoise is now extinct. And so now we're going to, um, we're proposing to introduce a new species of tortoise to replace those functions uh, in that system. So again, uh, uh, species introduction. So in terms of removing species, um, Invasive species eradication is a big one here. Of course, invasive species are huge problems, so if you can get rid of them, that is really helpful. Uh, and in recent decades, we've gotten pretty good at this actually, uh, and shown that we can remove everything from uh, mice to rats to cats and sheep and goats and the like, uh, and do so on pretty large scale, um, at least island systems. This is not something that we really do effectively on continental scales, but we're doing this pretty well on pretty big islands at this point. And then last but not least, and, and most recent on the scene, I would say is gene drives. And here, of course, we're manipulating the genome of organisms to often introduce a deleterious allele uh, and in a process that drives that um, allele through the system, through the reproductive biology of that organism with the potential to extirpate a species locally or on larger scales. So as I said, all five of these are very powerful tools. And as Peter Parker said, um, or perhaps it was his uncle and it became his mantra thereafter, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the potential to do both good and have errors with these sorts of tools um, today and, and how we can go forward in terms of thinking about this. So to start with, let's think about just what we can do with these things. Uh, and BioControl has some wonderful examples of success stories, uh, such as Prickly Pear in Australia, as you can see in these photos, uh, prickly pear was a serious, nasty invasive plant, um, not just a nasty invasive plant, but one, one with spines. And the introduction of a single uh, exotic insect, Cactoblastus cactorum, a moth, uh, was able to decimate this, this uh, plant and uh, really address this problem. Uh, this is pretty powerful. You can see how powerfully effective tools like this can be. But it doesn't always happen this way. And the Macquarie Island case study uh, is one example of, of how you can see more complex outcomes. Uh, and in this system, so Macquarie Island is uh, far into the sub-Antarctic uh, region below Australia. Um, it is fairly isolated and as a result has lots of endemic species there, uh, endemic bird species and many seabirds use the system. Uh, there are lots of endemic plant species. And as a result of all this endemism has been declared heritage site. So a unique, unique place on the planet. Now, of course, in the times of mariners, we decided to introduce organisms to lots of islands around the world. And in this case, European rabbits were introduced. And these things like, of course, eat the plants, um, which is not so good. Um, as well, domestic cats were introduced into this system. And these guys like to eat the rabbits, which is good. But they also like to eat the seabirds uh, and other birds in the system, which is not so good. And in fact, in this system, uh, domestic cats have been accused of uh, extirpating uh, four species of birds from the system. And for those um, uh, that are endemic, of course, this means global extirpation. So this is a serious conservation problem, and it was proposed that cats be removed from the system to address this problem. Uh, and this was all documented by Bergstrom and colleagues. Uh, and cats were successfully removed from this system, um, which was great. Uh, and that, of course, removed this predation pressure on the birds in the system, which was fantastic and the intended outcome of this action. But it also reduced uh, predation on rabbits and rabbits uh, increased in abundance uh, and increased their impacts on the endemic vegetation communities. Not only that, but uh, as a result of the of this pressure on the native plants, um, exotic plants that were in the system, but not flourishing uh, began to uh, take hold uh, in, uh, given these circumstances. 
So here we have a case where we have a very uh, intended uh, and powerful and good outcome that happened, uh, as well as some fairly deleterious side effects that happened in the system from, from a larger conservation perspective. And this is the sort of situation that I want to talk about today. And I want to point out that for each of the five um, conservation actions I've mentioned so far, each one of these has its own literature um, uh, on debates about whether or not we should be using these tools uh, based on both uh, many anecdotes like this case study here, as well as a lot of arm waving as to what might happen. But there have not been um, any wholesale uh, evaluations of just how often we have intended versus unintended effects in these systems. And nor, I think, have there been a really good approach toward how we might resolve this problem. And so I want to address both of these uh, issues today. And we have uh, really just two simple objectives today. First, um, we, I want to overview results of a global literature review that we conducted to evaluate um, these sorts of outcomes, these conservation actions, to ask, how often do we actually achieve our intended objective? How often do we hit the target? Uh, when unintended outcomes occur, um, how often do they occur, first off, first off? And when they do occur, why do they occur? Because of course, if we're gonna uh, try and mitigate this problem, we need to understand it better. And then the final question we wanna ask is, how well do we screen for unintended effects? Are we doing a good job of trying to think about and, and screen for and avoid these things as we go in um, before we initiate these actions. And I don't wanna stop just there with the quantification and identification of a problem. I wanna also offer solutions to this. Um, and so uh, uh, what I wanna do is talk about how community ecology might help us out in two respects. One is um, by introducing you to a community assessment framework that can be used as a basic screening tool or assessing and evaluating these actions before they take place. Uh, and this is a very simple back of the envelope sort of tool that pretty much anyone can apply. Um, and I think it can help. And then I wanna talk about more advanced approaches that can build upon the community assessment uh, results to apply qualitative models um, to try and uh, more formally and objectively predict uh, outcomes that might happen. Uh, and again, in both, of these, both of these tools can I think help us both achieve intended uh, effects as well as avoid some of these unintended outcomes. Now, before uh, we jump into some results here, I want to set up some background in terms of thinking about this problem from a community college perspective. Because when you're talking about wholesale introductions or removals of species, you really are talking about a community level action. So organisms live within a milieu of other organisms, right? And this is the, the matrix that they live within. And in um, community ecology, we like to think about this as a community um, interaction web. Now note that this is different than a food web in that this is not focused on just trophic interactions. Here we wanna consider all interactions that are important in the system. And so this is trophic and non-trophic interactions, things like uh, competition, facilitation, uh, mutualisms like pollination um, and ecosystem engineering, all the interactions that structure um, these sorts of ecological communities. And if we think about what we're doing in this, this manner, let me see if I can pull up a pointer here and start using this. Um, we can think about both how effective we are in terms of our, our intended objective, but we can also begin to assess uh, other outcomes that happen in the system. And so in this case, our intended objective might be the introduction of this ground squirrel. Um, and therefore, uh, the defined uh, success there would be establishment of viable ground squirrel populations in the system. Um, and then we might evaluate how uh, non-target species, other species in this community might change, uh, whether they increase or decrease. And of course, if they do change, we would wanna know the pathway of interaction. Is it a simple direct interaction? Is it a more complex indirect effect? Is it density or trait mediated and so forth? To really be able to understand both um, what we're doing, uh, both looking backward to see what we've, what we've done and looking forward to see how um, we can improve on what we're doing. Okay, so the other thing, so, so, so we use this framework to think about and assess case studies um, after the fact. The other thing that we wanted to look at was how often are studies um, considering non-target species. And of course, in each case, 
each case is unique. You have a unique set of organisms, lots of types of linkages that could be happening. And so going into each case study in this way, um, in a web like shown here is, is a little bit complex. So try to simplify this uh, and think about it more from the perspective of, of quantifying how many types of interactions are considered. And so what we're looking at here, and I'll come back to this later, is a community assessment framework where we think about our target species in the center here, and we think about the halo of interactions, all the types of interactions around that target that might interact with that species that would make up um, this network of interactions that connects us to other organisms in the system. And so here we would consider, of course, resources, um, food sources of our target species, or if it's a plant, nutrients that it uses, um, competitors, potential predators, pathogens in the system, uh, mutualist ecosystem engineering effects that it might have or that it might be linked to, um, abiotic factors that it might affect. And of course, um, anthropogenic factors are important to consider as well. If we're introducing or removing a species, um, often there's going to be societal implications of that. And we want to consider those as well. So the basic idea is here, here is that you can walk around this um, framework and think about all the types of interactions. Uh, and here I want to point out that most organisms are likely to have a minimum of at least two to three types of interactions. Most organisms are going to have a, a food that they eat or nutrients that they require, um, competitors they interact with, uh, and consumers that are, are e eating them or taking of them in some way. And so we would expect in most cases, organisms would have a minimum of say two to three of these interactions with the potential to have more. And so we, what we did was simply quantify how many types of interactions rather than all the, the whole network of interactions in each of these cases. Okay, so let, with that background, um, Community Ecology 101, to get us going here, let's talk about some of the results that we found. Okay, so in our global literature review, we identified 172 cases that fit our criteria. Of those, 111 documented management outcomes. Why did they all not do so? Well, some of these were proposed cases. So we evaluated both proposed cases and um, cases after the fact of the action. And so um, not all of the proposed cases, of course, could document outcomes. And so we're gonna focus here on these outcomes now uh, in terms of this topic. Okay, so what did we find? Of these 111 cases, uh, we found that 51% of them reported only intended outcomes back to that in a bit. 26% um, of them reported mixed outcomes. And so the mixed category here is defined as both intended outcomes and effects on non-target species. All right, so collectively over 75% of the time we are achieving our intended outcomes if we had these categories together. So that's good, I think, uh, for starters. Um, but we're also seeing that 26% of the time we are documenting um, impacts or, or effects on non-target species. Now, I want to be very clear here that just because there's a change in a non-target species abundance, this minute, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a tragic outcome. So it may not be that big of a deal, maybe it increases or decreases a little bit, uh, and that was documented. Uh, in some cases, maybe it is um, a deleterious effect, but perhaps uh, something that we can accept relative to the overall benefit of the, the intended effect. And of course, in other cases, um, we can have some pretty dire effects, uh, as in the Macquarie case, which is one of uh, the cases that's listed here. So a range of types of mixed effects that can happen. And then finally, we had 10% that uh, listed wholly only um, unintended outcomes. How does this happen? Well, for instance, if you're trying to uh, poison rats on an island and you're unsuccessful, you could certainly have effects on non-target species. Okay. So the next point I want to make, a uh, major point here, is that there's a reporting bias. Um, and this makes us revisit this list above. So the more interactions a study reported, the more unintended um, outcomes or non-target species were affected. And so what we're seeing from this is that we're not looking very intensively into the web. And the more we look, the more we see. And so probably this category of 51% of only uh, intended effects is likely to be more mixed effects. Um, going on out there if we were looking deeper into these, uh, these webs. The next point I want to address is screening for unintended outcomes and the question of how well are we screening? 
So here we found that 51% of the cases examined two or more interaction types. And remember I said that most organisms are likely to have a minimum of two to three interaction types. So this is not, this is not too bad, actually. Half of the cases are looking fairly deeply into the, these webs. However, 39% considered only one interaction type um, and 10% considered uh, no non-target species whatsoever. So 49% of the time, we're probably uh, not even considering some of the most important basic interactions among organisms in the system. And so there's, I think, a lot of room for improvement here in terms of thinking about our actions uh, in particular before we initiate. The final point I wanna make here, which is very important, is that 95% of the unintended effects arose from simple density mediated direct and indirect interactions. And I'll explain these a bit in a moment, but to me, this translates as a community ecologist, this translates to a great opportunity to do better because most likely we can predict a lot of these um, outcomes before they happen. So let me just highlight what I'm talking about here. So, 68% uh, of the outcomes were simple density interactions. So in this case, perhaps our ground squirrel is, is eating and reducing the abundance of a food source in the system or directly competing with an organism in the system strong enough to affect abundance changes in their populations. So these are pretty straightforward interactions, I think, to think about. Simple density um, mediated direct interactions. Now, 25% of our other cases were indirect effects, but they were also density mediated and they were first order indirect effects. So uh, in these cases, our, our target species was interacting with directly with the species, which in turn was affecting um, another species uh, through an indirect effect. And because these are density mediated in particular, these are not such hard indirect effects actually um, to hone in on. Um, because as a general rule, we find that, uh, that you need a strong effect, direct effect, in order to transmit a strong indirect effect. And so if we're able to look at these direct effects, which are pretty straightforward, and identify ones that are particularly strong, this will help us to identify potential um, density uh, mediated simple indirect effects here. So this gives me hope that we can actually uh, begin to apply community ecology uh, based approaches to really think about this problem better as we move forward. So let's talk about some solutions here. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is a community uh, assessment framework as a basic screening tool, as I mentioned before, for really uh, basically just mapping out the, the likely players in the web that could be affected by uh, proposed action. And this is really a back of the envelope approach that pretty much anyone can do readily and I think can help us uh, improve um, given that the bar is not that high, I think, right now in terms of it. And then I wanna talk about taking this a step further using qualitative models to apply them to our assessment uh, and then be able to begin to perhaps predict outcomes in more objective and advanced ways. And these two are pretty uh, interrelated, so I'm gonna talk about these together. Okay. So as a community ecologist, I will be the first to admit to you that this uh, seems a bit daunting to think about given all the potential interactions that our, that our species, our target species here might have in a system, trying to uh, identify the ones that really are likely to be problematic or important to our efforts here is, is yeah, a little daunting. So what I'm gonna do here is I wanna use sort of first principles from community ecology to break this down and simplify this problem and really think about this. All right, so for starters here, uh, let's, let's there, there are basically five pieces of information um, when we look at a community interaction web that really are required to understand outcomes uh, in the network and linkages that are important. In the network. And so let's identify this. So the first one is the other nodes or species in the system, obviously. And the key here, of course, is thinking about them from the perspective of which ones are directly or indirectly linked to our target species. And so the second piece of information that you actually need is these interactions that link organisms in the network, again, with the emphasis on our target species. And right away, we'll begin to screen out a bunch of species that are not directly linked. The third piece of information we need here is kind of a freebie because it is understanding the nature of these linkages. Um, and uh, that is to say whether they're a positive effect or a negative effect. 
And pretty much any time you draw one of these lines, you get the outcome there. So if we draw a line between ground squirrels and coyotes because coyotes eat ground squirrels, we know right away that the effect on coyotes is likely to be positive um, because that's a food for them and negative for the ground squirrels as the prey bits, right? So that's three of our five pieces of information. The fourth piece of information we need is interaction strength. How strong are these interactions? And this is really important, again, for both screening out lots of interactions that are not likely to be strong enough for us to care about, uh, and focusing in on those interactions that are, in fact, likely to be important. And so interaction strength is, uh, is really uh, is key here. And community ecology, uh, empirical studies of community ecology over the years have, have shown us, demonstrated repeatedly, that while Communities tend to have many, many types of linkages going on and many, many linkages in the system. By far, um, most, but there's a very small proportion of those that actually are strong interactions that drive the system. So here, if we can focus on those strong interactions, we can ignore a lot of other interactions and really get to the meat of what matters. Okay, the last piece of information that we need, of course, is abundance on these organisms. And if we have all of these uh, pieces of information, we can, in theory, um, since you May 1974, quantify and predict the effect of altering the abundance or removing one of our species from this community on all of the other organisms in the community. Now, this is demonstrated um, mathematically, uh, and this can be done. Um, however, these models are fairly sensitive. Um, and I guess I would like to say, you know, if you could, if, if you think about this, this is a really powerful tool. Uh, if you could predict how any manipulation we're gonna do in a system is gonna affect the system at large, that is a powerful tool for conservation that we should be using. And so you might ask, why aren't we using this tool if it's been around since 1974? And the reason for this is that these approaches that we've been uh, really anchored in in ecology for a long time are very quantitative. Um, approaches and very exact. And the, the, the models underlying these approaches, they're based on logical term models, they're differential equations that have assumptions of linearity that are probably not met, um, equilibrium, um, the system being at or near equilibrium. Uh, and these models are very sensitive to poor data inputs. If you have bad data going in or you violate assumptions, they pretty much break. Um, and to the point that not only are you not going to predict uh, how much exactly an organism changes in the system in response to a perturbation, but the, the models actually end up uh, failing to actually predict even the direction that an, any organism might change in terms of the abundance in the system. So the exacting nature of these models has just has really high data demands that have really limited their applications. But the underlying theory is, is very sound. Now, there are tools out there that can maybe help us get around this. For instance, or qualitative models like fuzzy cognitive mapping um, kind of cheat this game. Uh, these sorts of models look at, they try and predict qualitative rather than quantitative outcomes. And if you can accept a qualitative outcome, such as just simply predicting whether an organism is gonna increase or decrease, and if it's gonna increase and decrease or decrease by a little or a lot, then you can use qualitative inputs into your models and the models are pretty robust um, to limitations in the data quality that's going in uh, and generally robust. And so this is a potential tool to really get around uh, this limitation that we've been up against for such a long time. So I'm gonna come back to uh, qualitative models and fuzzy cognitive mapping later, um, but this is ultimately where we wanna to get to. However, there is a really big step between um, getting from this, uh, this, this web um, that I'm showing here to applying either quantitative or qualitative models. And that is identifying specifically the web that is of interest to us because there are simply too many species and too many complexities. Um, if we use all, if we just capture all the species in any recipient community and try and model all of this. So this is something that hasn't really been addressed in the past. And we wanted to try and develop a tool to better think about and identify the community interaction web of concern um, going into these actions. And so we developed this community assessment framework, which I briefly introduced you to earlier. And the idea behind this tool is that you can 
focus on your target organism and walk through systematically all of these potential interactions to identify the uh, community interaction web that is potentially important to the actions that we're, we're trying to initiate. And so I briefly introduced you to this earlier. What I wanna do now is I wanna simply apply this, walk you through this as in a, in a mocked up example here to show you how this can work. Okay, so in our uh, hypothetical, hypothetical example here, we are going to introduce, uh, we'll call it an Arctic ground squirrel, um, or we're gonna move an Arctic ground squirrel for assisted migration purposes. So we're concerned that this uh, squirrel is gonna be threatened by climate change. Uh, and we are going to move it from the mainland uh, in Alaska to an island far north of its current range. So it will be a new species in that system. Now, as we start out here, I'm gonna tell you that the island that we're targeted on because it's so darn cold, doesn't have people living on it or major management human actions. And so we don't really have uh, major issues to concern ourselves with in terms of those human components. Uh, and if we look to the literature, we we'll see that there's not major pathogens of concern with this organism. Um, so we can uh, check that box off. We don't have any major linkages to concern ourselves there. And I'm, I'm going to pause here for a moment to state that the process I'm going through here is one of, you can lean to the literature, the published literature on organisms to uh, answer these questions and document these sorts of linkages. Uh, you can look to natural history information or maybe some data that you have from the system. Uh, and expert opinion can be used to, these, to, to do these sorts of things, to identify what sort of linkages might be important. All right, so let's continue forward. So in terms of mutualists, um, we also see from the literature that there's no major mutualist um, interactions. Uh, if we jump down here to abiotic, there is an important abiotic linkage to the species but it falls into the category of ecosystem engineering. So we're gonna talk about it there. And that linkage is that this is a burrowing rodent. And on our hypothetical island, we currently do not have any major burrowing rodent species. And so this will uh, potentially introduce um, these burrows into the system and this behavior into the system. And that can have some important um, uh, effects because of its novelty. So, even as you look at this, this pic that I randomly pulled off of the internet to make this figure, you can see that there are some little plants around it that look to me as somebody who studies a lot of weeds, uh, like they're probably uh, annual weeds and likely exotic ones. Uh, and so the literature in fact documents very well that this sort of burrowing behavior and disturbance uh, really facilitates exotic plants. So this might be something that we wanna consider here on our island, which is uh, fairly pristine. So we'll keep that on the board. The next thing we know from natural history uh, information about our island is that burrowing owls occasionally show up there. They don't seem to stay around very long. Um, they might be there for a season and then disappear, but every few years we, we see them show up. Uh, now, burrowing owls do live in burrows, but they don't dig their own burrows. They use burrows that are dug by ground squirrels and um, prairie dogs and things like that. And so introducing this component to the system could actually allow these owls to establish viable populations in the system. And that could certainly be an important um, effect on the system. So we're gonna keep that note on, on board here. If we move on around our, our circle here, our halo, uh, and think about resources, well, this is an herbivore. They certainly eat lots of grasses and forbs, but in the literature it doesn't show that there's a much of an impact here that many of the grasses to rebound in response to this, uh, and we don't see any particular species that they tend to impact. And so we're going to pull this off the board, not because there's no interactions here, but because we don't think these interactions will be strong enough to matter. And so that's another really important, strong way, really important point I want to make is that interaction strength is really the key. We want to think about the potentially strong interactions here, uh, and we're going to ignore interactions that we can justify um, are likely to be weak. Now, on our hypothetical island, when we think about competitors, we have, we're gonna call um, it a spotted lemming in the system. It's been on this island for a very long time, isolated from the mainland, and as a result, it is an endemic species or species in this system. So it's fairly unique there, and this is a species that we might be concerned about. Now, when we think about competition with ground squirrels, uh, the most likely competition is through herbivory in the food source. And we just said that ground squirrels aren't having a big impact on that. So that's probably not a big deal. They could of course um, directly uh, interfere with each other through an interference competition 
But this also is not um, something that is, we find evidence of when we look into the literature. And so I'm going to pull this arrow off of the screen here. There's no competitive linkage with this organism showing. But I'm going to leave this picture on the screen because we're going to, we're going to link it in here in a moment. So as we get to our last potential uh, type of interaction here, which is predators, we see that, in fact, we do have Arctic foxes, not surprisingly, on this island, given where it's at. And Arctic foxes would love to have ground squirrels in their diet. That's a nice big version of what they usually eat, which is things like this little lemming. Uh, and so that could really increase Arctic fox populations here. And so the rule of thumb that we apply in applying this framework is that if you have a species like this fox that you think is strongly linked to your target species, you should then apply the framework again to that organism um, to identify potential indirect linkages. Now, I'm not going to beat this into the ground, but let's just apply this briefly to say that, whoops, that Arctic foxes, of course, like to eat birds, much like the domestic cats on Macquarie Island. And so that could be an important effect. Uh, and of course, they love to eat microteen, rodents, and lemmings and things like that. That's their mainstay, in fact, although they haven't suppressed lemmings on this island in the past or decimated them, I should say. Um, they may have potential to going forward with this introduction of this new food source through a potential food subsidy to these lemmings. All right, so now the lemmings are linked in here. And applying the same rule that we just did to the fox, we come down here to the, the, the owl and we would um, want to think about all the interactions that it might have. And here we identify that it, of course, likes to eat small rodents and will be a new predator of these lemmings if it does establish in the system. Uh, and we would do the same with uh, the weeds, but suffice to say that this is, hopefully this gives you the idea of mapping this out. And I wanna point out a few things here. And one is that we went from a potentially incredibly complex network of linkages, and we've now filtered down to um, really just six species are on this screen, and one of those is our target species. So we have some interactions here that may be of concern, but there's, it's not hugely overcomplicated. The second point I wanna make is that by mapping these interactions out, we are identifying some potential effects, um, in particular on this, uh, this endemic subspecies or species here. We might add a new predator to the system that eats it. We might increase predation on this. We might also affect um, seabirds over here. And so we might want to stop at this point with our proposed action and maybe do some more research, try and understand if there's a real threat to the lemming or not before we move forward. Um, also assess our weed issue over here um, and see if maybe we can mitigate this. Or we might simply decide that we're going to move to another island where we don't have this lemming um, and, and only have to consider perhaps the weed. Okay, so my point here is by simply doing this very basic mapping exercise using literature and, and, and extant information that you might have in the system, you can go through this process of, of identifying potential linkages, both direct and indirect pathways um, that might be strongly linked to your target species and could, of course, both uh, influence, uh, bring about unintended effects as, as well as uh, impact your success. So the Arctic foxes, of course, could inhibit our success of getting our ground schools established. And that's another consideration we might have. So the simple mapping exercise, I think, could really help us out. But imagine we can take this a step farther and begin to apply a model to this where we could actually predict whether that lemming is going to be um, uh, impacted or not. So let's talk a little bit about uh, taking this up a notch and using uh, qualitative models. So here, in particular, I wanna talk about fuzzy cognitive mapping as a type of qualitative model that has great potential here. So this modeling approach was developed in the social sciences uh, and it was designed for trying to understand human networks and how uh, human-based social networks might change as a function of one of the nodes in, in a network changing. Um, and it's all qualitatively based, so you predict how one node in a network might change the direction or the amount of uh, effect that it might have on another node in the system. And so it's qualitatively based in terms of its inputs as well. And these, um, these approaches have been used in the social sciences for a long time and well vetted there, and they work pretty well. More recently, they have been uh, transferred and migrated over to uh, ecological systems uh, 
uh, and Ramsey and Veltman 2005 here are not the first to do this, but in my mind, this is one of the first papers that I think really did a nice job of looking at the strengths and weaknesses of quantitative um, versus qualitative models for these sorts of approaches and really illustrating how this could be uh, an effective tool. Um, and so I, I highly recommend um, looking into this piece. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the results uh, that they found to illustrate this process. So in this case, again, predicting qualitative outcomes with qualitative data, they built their simple uh, network here around this kokako. It's a uh, New Zealand bird that's threatened, um, depicted down here in the, in the picture. Uh, this is a real deal. This is not a deemed hypothetical. And it is being threatened by uh, ship rats, stoats, and possums, which are all introduced predators in the system. Of course, there's a food source of the kakako, which is also partaken of by some of these other organisms. And so now they build in all these linkages in this network. They've identified the nodes. They built the linkages and the directions of the interactions. And they use some, some various types of data that they have from the system to assign um, qualitative interaction strengths, as you can see shown here uh, in this graphic. They then run this through the models to ask how they can benefit these kokakos. And these predators, I should say, are not necessarily targeting the adult birds, but more the, the young fledgings, uh, the, the eggs and the, and the young. And so we're looking at effects on fledging rates. So we asked the model, you know, how we can benefit the kokakos by increasing fledging rates. And the first thing we see, of course, is that if you suppress all three of these species substantially, you can increase the fledging rates for these birds. This is great but it's not easy to do. So as we run the model, we see that in fact, if you just suppress one of these uh, predators, you won't have any effect on benefiting kakakos. If you suppress two of these uh, predators, it depends on which two you suppress. And there's only one combination that really seems to work. And that is the combination of suppressing both the rats and the possums. And the reason for this is you get kind of a freebie here in that the stoats are also living off of the ship rats. So if you can reduce ship rat populations, you reduce stoats as well. And so you effectively achieve um, reduction in all three of their, their abundances. And so you can see hopefully how this is, can be a really powerful tool for directing conservation actions like this or um, um, other efforts going on in a system like gene drives, biocontrol and so forth. Um, so as I said, these tools are increasingly being applied to conservation, but very much like this case study right here, they're being applied to predict outcomes, but we don't actually know the outcome. So we don't actually know if this model is correct or not. Uh, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to vet these, these models um, by applying them to a case study where we have really good data. And so we went to Yellowstone Lake. So Yellowstone Lake is the giant lake that's in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, presumably everybody knows about this place. Um, and that system, because it's in a national park, has been really, really well studied. And it was really well studied in the old days before exotics were introduced and has been studied since. Uh, and what happened in that system was some fishermen thought it would be really neat to introduce big lake trout into the system, which are big predators, um, so that they could catch them, I guess. And so this was an illegal introduction. But both before and after situation was well documented. And I'll just give you the highlights of what took place. In the pre-lake trout system, Yellowstone cutthroat trout was a dominant um, predator in that system. And uh, it supported uh, uh, an important food web in that system. Post-lake trout introduction, what we saw happen was the lake trout suppressed um, virtually decimated the Yellowstone cutthroat trout populations. And this is still going on uh, to the point that it reduced a lot of the, the the effect, the benefits to other species in the system, including a very interesting interaction that happened here where the, lot, the reduction in cutthroats result, resulted in reduced um, spawning runs that were happening in the creeks, right? And grizzly bears were coming to the spawning runs to eat those cutthroat trout as they do to salmon runs. Uh, and so when, the, when that faucet turned off, grizzly switched over to being on elk calves, which um, because the elk are calving at the very same time that those cutthroat trout runs happen. And so this actually reduced um, calving success of uh, elk in the system. So this is a long chain of interactions from the aquatic system all the way into the terrestrial system that happened. All right, and that's the real outcome in the system. So using this system, what we did was we used the data from pretreatment only to build our models and then ask the question, what 
uh, how, how well did they predict outcomes post-treatment? And we did so in three scenarios. Um, we wanted to use first the best model we could, the fully informed model, which has all the information available. Uh, and then we wanted to dummy the model down because often we don't have very good information while we're doing conservation actions. So in our second simulation, we included interaction direction and interaction strength, but we, we did not use information on abundance, which commonly is not, um, there's commonly not very good available data on abundance when we're working in systems. Um, so this is a good realistic scenario. Uh, in simulation three, we dummied the model down even more. So we didn't even know interaction strength here. So this is basically just a simple web linking organisms uh, and the direction of interaction, but no strength of interaction. Okay, so what did we find? <clears throat> and don't worry about the details of these this uh, table. I'm gonna highlight this. So the black um, over on the far left here is the empirical results. That's what really happened in the system. Um, and then we have simulation one, two, and three results from left to right here. And we asked two questions of these models. How well did they predict the direction of change and abundance of all the organisms in the system? And how well did they predict the, um, uh, the categorical change in abundance? So did they change a little or a lot? And we see for simulation one that it was over 90% correct in predicting the direction of change and abundance of all the in this network. So this is pretty good. Moreover, we see that it was over 70% um, accurate in predicting the categories, the category of change that would happen. Was the species going to change a little or a lot? Now, when we dummy down the models in simulations uh, two and three, they both did uh, similarly. Uh, they continued to do fairly well in terms of predicting the direction of change. So over 80% um, correct. But when it came down to predicting which categories, categorical abundance change would happen, um, they didn't do very well. They were only 10% correct. However, and you won't be able to see it in this table, I'm gonna do a different table for the manuscript. Um, but in the final analysis, you'll be able to see that I would point out that, that even though there were a lot of errors in predicting the categories, they weren't necessarily that far off. So what I mean by that is, um, the real value may have been low, but the, out, the predicted um, outcome may have been very low. Okay, so not so bad in terms of, of conservation action thinking, right? If it starts predicting high, and this was done in some cases when in fact the real outcome is low, then that's gonna make you pretty nervous. Uh, and that did happen in some cases, but most of the predictions were not that far off. Okay, and I want to follow up to say that this complex interaction um, was predicted successfully. This effect of late trout in suppressing cuts from trout and reducing grizzly bear feeding on cuts and shifting their, their feeding onto elk and thereby reducing elk calving success was predicted by the fully uh, parameterized model. So this is just an anecdote. It's a single case study, but it seems that these models do have some potential to win well parameters to fairly effectively predict outcomes in these systems. But I would say even when they're poorly parameterized, being able to simply um, uh, say that which organisms are gonna increase or decrease, are likely to increase or decrease in the system, even if you can't predict by how much, uh, again, is a step up in terms of our ability to begin to identify problems uh, before they happen. Okay, so so far, so hopefully that gives you a sense of, of the potential usefulness of this tool. Now, so far I have been um, using examples of species introductions. Of course, species removals are just the reverse of that and conceptually um, the same in all regards. But I can appreciate that this audience is interested in gene drives. And so I wanted to also mock up a hypothetical example to, to think about gene drives and how these tools might possibly help people um, avoid unintended outcomes and perhaps help us do a better job in executing gene drives if we were to do them. I wanna be very clear that as a USDA employee, I'm not advocating doing this, but if we're going to do them as a community ecologist, I suggest that we try and do, bring to bear the best science that we can. So, um, and this is based on me spending about 30 minutes becoming, trying to get familiar with this system on the internet uh, using the Oracle. So if I have egregious errors, errors here, please don't hold them against me. And, and again, the point here is to, uh, is heuristic um, in that we can have a sense of maybe how this tools can be beneficial. 
All right, so let's say we have um, uh, an interest in conducting a, dean, uh, a gene drive for 80s Egypti here, uh, because we know it's a nasty vector of lots of diseases like dengue, yellow fever, Zika, and others. And so it's a good target, and we have a gene drive for it. So if we applied our framework, um, we, uh, and, and let's say we're doing this in Equatorial Africa. If we apply our framework, uh, we might, and I'm not gonna go through the whole framework here uh, and exhaust with that, uh, we might see that there are potential other competitors in the system. So we have potentially Anopheles, a species of Anopheles in the system as well. They could compete with it. And um, based on some literature that I was able to find that actually documents mosquito diets, we see that in fact, they list the same diet for these, um, for these organisms. They do indicate that they have some different feeding strategies. And so uh, if food is fairly abundant, these different feeding strategies could limit competition. However, if these guys are feeding, or these guys are existing in very small basins of water, like tires or whatever around humans, uh, then competition might very well be a big deal, uh, even with these different uh, feeding niches. And also there seems to be evidence that some mosquitoes at least uh, can detect that there are already other larvae of other species in a pool of water and may avoid and so that could be more of an interference competition. So let's say we do in fact have evidence that competition might be important here. Uh, and of course we know that an awfully species can vector malaria and malaria, that malaria is probably worse than all these other diseases combined in terms of uh, human fatality rates uh, and impacts on human populations. So this being the case, we might um, take a pause here uh, and we might not want to do a drive on Egypti that might increase anopheles and malaria in the system. And so maybe we would step back and say, well, let's hold off until we have the drive available for the species of anopheles as well. And we will initiate drives for both of these species simultaneously, um, which will avoid this unintended effect and have in fact uh, a better intended effect overall. Okay, another uh, potential scenario here as we walk through our framework uh, we perhaps identify uh, an endemic bat species that is very, uh, very focused on uh, mosquitoes. And so taking out both of these species might have a big impact on this, this, ende this endemic or endangered species. So here we might decide, well, maybe that's just collateral damage and saving human lives is more important. Um, or we might decide, well, maybe there's a way that we can mitigate this effect on this species uh, now that we're aware of it as we go forward. And certainly if we're going to blow it off and say that it's not that important, we would wanna document this thing, I think, so that, so that um, it's known in advance. Now, just as one more hypothetical here that people might not think about because it, it's linked to a very positive outcome. And that is, let's say that we, we have both of our drives, we initiate them and we're highly successful in taking disease out of a system that has been a really big problem in a, in a region, uh, a local regional area. <laughs> Uh, and that region is particularly uh, limited in terms of resources in the first place. So we could have a situation where we begin to influence and increase human population in an area that's already kind of marginal. Now, this is not a bad thing. Um, this is what we're intending to do. We're trying to make things better for humans, of course. Uh, but this is a kind of thing that might be valuable for local governments or NGOs um, to know in advance so that they can begin to prepare for this sort of analysis as you go forward. So again, very hypothetical mocked up example, but hopefully it gives you a sense of how you might be able to use these tools if you're going to execute gene drives to both um, be more effective in achieving attended outcomes and possibly avoiding or at least highlighting uh, potential um, deleterious things that might happen. Okay, so I will uh, just highlight some conclusions here and that I will shut up uh, and uh, other people can some input here. Um, the first point I want to make is based on our literature review, we, we see that non-target effects of uh, species introductions and extirpations for conservation are, they're common and they're not that well screened for. And so I would say the bar for improvement is, <clears throat> is excuse me, not super high. As a result, I think even taking a simple tool like applying the community assessment framework to just simply map out the potential linkages that your organism of interest might have in the system could help us highlight and, invert some, and, and uh, avert some unintended outcomes, like in the case of our spotted lemming. 
Moreover, I think that using these tools can help establish a, uh, a systematic, transparent, and defensible uh, process for documenting um, these sorts of risks a priori. And if you have stakeholders, the, the critical stakeholders at the table while you're going through this process, um, I think you're just going to be so much more uh, better defended in terms of going forward with the action, with having daylight on all of the potential outcomes. Uh, and if something but bad does happen, I think you're just in a, in a better position um, in terms of the efforts that have been made to try and avoid that. Uh, I would add that fuzzy cognitive models and other qualitative models, Bayesian approaches and others can be used to formalize this process. You need to do the community assessment first to establish what is the, the interaction network you're looking at, but then you can apply these tools to maybe more objectively uh, and more quantitatively with air quotes around that and that you're predicting qualitative outcomes, um, assess what might happen in your network when you take your management action. So these could be really helpful tools, I think. And finally, in recognition of the fact that not everyone is a modeler capable of applying these tools, um, we have been developing a user interface that is a nice user-friendly sort of thing that has all the R code behind it for applying fuzzy cognitive models or fuzzy cognitive um, uh, webs, as they're also called in conservation world, uh, to these sorts of problems to be able to mock up and, and work through these scenarios. Um, with more user-friendly tools. Uh, this is not quite done yet, and this will be introduced with the manuscript uh, that I referred to where we're vetting these uh, methods in the LS2, like case study and so forth. So these will be coming soon to a uh, theater near you uh, and in beta test form. So uh, if people do use them, feedback will be appreciated. And so with that, um, I guess I'll leave my screen up as Dave had suggested, and I will Turn this over to Dave uh, so that he can uh, deal with questions. Great, Th thanks a lot, Dave, and uh, thanks for the for the community ecology uh, uh, lesson. Re really fantastic, and I, and I just want to give you a shout out for uh, you know taking a step into the gene drive world, even though and, and mosquitoes and things like that. Even though I know that is way outside your. Uh, your remit in terms of what you do, but uh, in terms of trying to, Hopefully to, I wasn't to link it together. <laughs> no, I, and, and we're not going to, uh, and at least I'm not going to uh, quibble about what you're doing, but I appreciate you trying to to bring it there to show, um, you know, how, how this, 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 this framework might be used. Anyway, let me, let me uh, first of all, encourage people in the audience to, to, you know, chat in your questions. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to take them. Uh, Dean, I, I guess one of the things that I'd like to start out just by talking about was, I guess my s surprise, uh, maybe, th and, and this is what I'd like you to respond to, is that people didn't even look for unintended consequences in a lot of these studies that you, you mentioned. And, and these were conservation management, in, you know, interventions and, and people didn't look for unintended consequences. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit you know, surprised uh, by that. And, and why, 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 you know, how can that, how can that be? <laughs> Is that just yeah, a failure of, of, of uh, well, you tell me. Well, it's, it's a good point, Dave. And there's, there's some caveats here. Uh, and, and I would say that certainly some, some have, uh, and those overall results are, of course, the collective. Uh, and certainly some fields do a better job than others. For instance, um, biocontrol of plants um, is probably one of, the, one of the most rigorous out there in terms of looking to at least make sure that their biocontrols are not gonna feed on other plants in the system, right? Um, they don't necessarily uh, tend to concern themselves with things that might eat the biocontrol and interactions that might happen in that way, but there is some rigor there. Um, I, and the other thing that I would say is that we're not, I think there's two other things I wanna say. One is that there is definitely this, this tendency to have blinders on uh, and that we go in thinking about our specific organism. Like I'm concerned about tuataras because they're threatened by climate change. And so I wanna to move to tuataras and I don't really, I'm gonna move them to an island 30 kilometers away. And so probably that's fine. I'm just concerned about tuataras. And so I don't really think about the network that I'm putting the organism in 
um, because I'm focused on that organism. And I think that's where we get into trouble. Uh, and that's really what I'm trying to uh, get at here with the tools that we're bringing about is just to, just to give people a means for thinking about uh, in a formal way what that network might be and what those interactions might be because they, they can both help you avoid unintended effects, but also help you be successful in your intended outcome. If you don't think about diseases that might affect tuataras, for instance, on that island 30 miles away, um, and they're there, that could be the, the undermining of, of your success. The final thing that I wanna um, make, and this is an important point here, is that we are doing an after the fact assessment on published literature, right? Because it's hard to uh, review the white, uh, the, the, um, the unpublished literature. And there, so it's not the best method for assessing whether or not people looked at certain things before they went into a management outcome. Um, rather, we're just seeing what was looked at after the fact uh, and published. And so it's the best we have to try and get at this and quantifying it, but um, I think it's important to recognize that. A question from uh, from Brenda Doss about the modeling and uh, the fuzzy cognitive map. And the question is, how do you determine the strength of interactions? So, interaction. So you can you can obtain info on interaction strength in in a number of ways. Uh, in food web scenarios, I think one good way to do it is to simply look at diets. And so, in one scenario where we've done that is we look at the proportion of diet that is comprised of an organism. So, if, if an organism is eating only 10% of food item A and it's eating 40% of its diet, or 50% is food item B, um, I would tend to say that B is a strong interaction that we want to consider, and that A is maybe more of a casual um, resource and a, and a weaker interaction that's, that's probably not as important. So that gives you one measure. There are lots of ways that you can do this and not all interactions, of course, are trophic um, and so food uh, related, but that's one way that you can assign interaction uh, strength. Yeah, in, the, in mapping the, the network and in sort of trimming the tree that you did, you had to have a lot of information about, you, you were making decisions about, well, this interaction is not important and, or significant and in the context of what you were doing and, and you therefore eliminated in your efforts to simplify. But you, you really need, still really needed to know a lot about that whole, that whole network in order to do that, didn't you? I mean, it, so there was a tremendous amount of, of knowledge that, that, that was required in order for you to simplify that, uh, this, the system. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. And, and so what we're trying to do with that framework is provide a tool so you can systematically do that. But ultimately, you need to do a bunch of homework. Um, I don't think it's an inordinate amount. I think it's um, uh, the sort of thing where you can look to the literature that's out there. You know, you pour through the literature on your species um, uh, that you're going to manipulate in your system and try and understand what those linkages might be from that. Um, both in terms of who might be linked, what the directions of those interactions are, and what those interaction strengths might be. Uh, in some cases, maybe you have some data that's been gathered in the system that might also help inform. But um, yeah, I think that that's, that's, it's just some homework basically that you can sit down and do. And the sort of thing that can take a week or a month, uh, but in the overall you know, um, commitment of doing something like adding or removing a species from a system, um, it's probably a fairly small time investment relative to the mistakes that you might make. Um, both again, in terms of the intended um, as well as the unintended outcomes. The other aspect of that I think that's important to consider is that it is still something of a subjective process. And I think you're touching on that um, well, because uh, yeah, I'm looking to the literature and I'm trying to decide what is a strong interaction and what is not. Um, and for that reason, I think having stakeholders involved in that process, expert opinion, stakeholders, the literature, um, and doing that in that sort of um, a forum is, is the most defensible way to do that. And yeah. uh, given that there is subjectivity to it. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'd like to come back to that in a, in a, in a minute and talk a little bit more about um, expanding the model to include, be, go, go beyond ecology, but which you did in your, in your last example. But, but Fred, uh, Fred Trippe uh, asked a question here. So such a framework be used to reassess or assess commonly used agricultural pesticides and is it already done? 
I do not know if it's already done. Um, I don't see any reason why it couldn't be used. Um, I think the framework, the beauty of these qualitative models is that you, the, the nodes don't even have to be species or organisms, they can be concepts. Yeah. Um, in fact, these come from social systems, right? Um, and yeah. sociology. Uh, and so you can link concepts in as well as management actions and organisms. And because of that, I think that they're really flexible in terms of the questions that can be examined. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see that you're, you're in your in your example with uh, with mosquitoes and, and disease transmitting vectors, you know, you expanded the model to there, there was another interaction. Right. And it was an interaction with people and people's health. And uh, often uh, uh, these discussions, at least a lot of the discussions that take place in the gene drive space with respect to, say, um, mosquitoes and uh, malaria interventions in places like Africa uh, tend to be sort of divided between ecology and then public health without linking those strongly. And, um, and so some of the, some of the strong criticisms that come uh, within this discussions of, of, of gene drive, again, um, say spe specifically mosquitoes in Africa, you know, have to do with really, you know, ecological questions about, um, you know, the bats eating the mosquitoes and so on and so forth. And, and often these are represented in good faith, but, but as this incredible complexity without considering some of the strengths of these interactions. So I think there's some opportunities there to, um, so that I, I see the value of, of this kind of, of modeling because it does, one, it types, it, it sort of formalizes your efforts to articulate what those interactions of importance are, whether they're ecological or not, yeah, and that then, flexibility allows you to bridge that gap. And, yes, and, so and, I and think then you can ask people, well, what are the strengths of these interactions? And, and these can be qualitative impressions, right? Because even if someone says, well, I think this is a strong interaction, and this is the model that we've, we've generated of interactions, you can run this simple qualitative model or semi-quantitative model, however you want to call it, and, and say, well, look, even if this is a strong interaction, you know, the, the outcome, the negative outcome that you're worried about isn't, isn't really, you know, isn't necessarily happening. Right. So, uh, so I think you're right that, that uh, I see these, and I, I just want to say that we have a webinar series coming up beginning in uh, November, November 3rd is our first one. And, uh, and our speaker is somebody from CSIRO who will be talking specifically about a more a very qual qualitative form of this network mapping and um, uh, sign diagraphs, where we're just looking at strengths, you know, positive or negative, as opposed to a strength. Um, and then we're actually going to have uh, somebody on November 17th talk more about fuzzy cognitive maps. Uh, Steve Gray from MSU, who has uh, who's done a lot of work with uh, fuzzy cognitive maps and, and so on. So, so this is a, a topic that that we here um, in this webinar series are going to be uh, exploring more. And so I'm really happy that you brought it up in, in this particular one. So, uh, let me just go to a couple of comments here or questions. So, uh, Stephanie James asks, how do you deal with specificity of location? in estimating interactions. So for example, when studies in the literature are conducted in a different place than where you are doing your work. Yeah, okay, so yeah, how do you, just how do, you, how do you do these extrapolations or do you? Yeah, I think, and again, that's where having some experts at the table is helpful because you, yeah. you, you are gonna be in a situation, I don't think there's gonna be any case where you're gonna have full data like our Yellowstone case study, right? And you're going to be sort of patching together information from maybe some data um, from your system, but overall, most of the literature is from someplace else uh, and so forth. And, and, and I think that that's a process. And again, um, there, I think, you know, having people who can do that extrapolation, and I've done that in some of this, well, the paper that we will have come out, will have an example like that, uh, where we're extrapolating from mainland systems to an island system. Um, that doesn't have some of the organisms uh, going on in it and doesn't have some of the evolutionary histories um, going on in it. And so 
you have to speculate um, to some extent. It's, it's an imperfect process. And that's where I, again, I feel like the qualitative approach is powerful because in the end, you can get away with some imperfection there and still get to the outcome. Is this organism likely to change? And is it likely to change a little mm -hmm. or a lot? Um, if that's all you need to know, then, then, then there's enough of a, uh, there's enough flexibility in there that you can get away with some of that, but you have to do the best you can with the tool you have. Yeah, obviously we're never going to have uh, full full knowledge of these systems, and uh, and so there's always this uh, there's always a level of uncertainty for sure. But I think what was interesting from your results of the of the lake the the trout model was that you know the predictions even with the minimal amount of of, of data you did eighty percent you know you it was I, I don't know what good is but. Um, you know, it's hard to say what good is, but uh, I guess, but, but to me that looked, well, that was doing pretty good. Even with a minimal amount of, of information, you were still generally getting things right in terms of impacts that you would predict. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that seemed pretty, uh, pretty encouraging. Um, comment from uh, Steve Panosian in the audience. Um uh, hey, Steve, by the way, uh, just an observation. Uh, the fuzzy cognitive web model could be helpful in pesticide evaluations. Many products now are genus specific. And my frontline experience has been that nature does not fill a vacuum once, does fill a vacuum once one species or genus is suppressed. So, um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think that's exactly what this, this kind of, uh, these kind of models can really help with. So I guess the, the, what's also nice about this particular approach is that it's fairly simple, isn't it? I'm, um, that you don't need to necessarily be a mathematical genius to 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 implement these. Um, true. Yeah. No. That and that's where we're really trying to go with this. So I'm not the modeler on this team. The other two authors are the modelers, um, and. Um, I think in the end, that's part of what I was looking to is having something that could be usable to people at my sort of skill level, who is not gonna probably run all the R code to do this, um, but could sit down on a user interface where the code is built into the background like you can with you know, some of the stat packages um, that allow people to apply statistics, um, even if you're not actually um, doing the detailed uh, nuts and bolts of the stats in the background. And so that's what we're hoping to accomplish with the user interface in particular is to, to make it even a little bit easier for, for users who, who don't have that sort of background. It's already built in for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. I get one of the sort of the daunting problems, it, again, speaking from the mosquito uh, point of view, and of course, this isn't the only possible application of gene drives. And, and some of the, the, the island examples were certainly... Um, particularly island rodents are certainly a target for people that are thinking about the application of gene drives for invasive species removal. But uh, just in talking, thinking about the malaria situation, I mean, we're talking about tropical ecosystems and, um, you know, it, so the, yeah, complex. And, um, and so there's a, a lot of complexity and, um, and, and in, so there's going to be, you know, just more uncertainty, but, but nevertheless, I think these approaches can be really, really, really helpful. So, so you mentioned that uh, this fuzzy cognitive webs, as, as you mentioned in this uh, discipline are used regularly. Is that so that that's uh, by managers in within wildlife management, they're using these tools? No, I would not say regularly, but increasingly. So mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you run through the literature, there was a paper by Hobbes in 2000 or 2002 um, on a lake system, um, the Ramsey and Beltman paper in 2005. Uh, as you go forward into modern times, um, there are probably a couple dozen papers that I could think of um, now. So it's happening more and more that people are, are, are doing this um, in terms of at least proposing and try and assess an action, like in Australia and New Zealand are areas where it's been done a fair bit, where they're thinking about um, bringing back uh, um, a species or another um, to a system where they've been uh, ex extinct for a long time. And so, so more and more it's coming in, but I definitely wouldn't say it's very prevalent at this point. Yeah, okay. Good. Well, I think at this point, uh, I'm going to close this out.
So, um, so Dean, I, I want to uh, thank you a lot for for uh, taking this step into uh, this other world of of gene drive. Uh, there are linkages, obviously. It's uh, you know there are conservation applications, but and, and I really appreciate the uh, the community ecology. Well, for me, it was it was a lot of great information, and I'm sure a lot of people in the audience also found it to be re really really helpful. And uh, it was this sort of rational approach of systematically looking at these systems and trying to, you know, decomplex them in a way that allows you to make decisions, I, th I think is, is really, really, to me, it was uh, really, really helpful. And, and I can see how this kind of approach could be used, not just by the ecologists, but as, as you said, you know, this, the, this particular form of, of uh, cognitive mapping or a network mapping and system design, system analysis uh, was originated in the social sciences uh, for the most part. And, and so you could see where this potentially could be a bridge to getting uh, the scientists and, uh, and publics interacting in a way that could be really, really meaningful. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. So to me, I, I mean, I find this to be uh, an interesting and exciting potential, uh, not something that's that's being done in, in certainly in the gene drive space at the moment. But uh, but if enough people can get stimulated by the possibilities, maybe maybe this will actually happen. So anyway, thanks again for being here. I really, really, really appreciate it.